Is it a great day to be a Christian? Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. In case you didn't know it, tomorrow's Halloween, so if you haven't already, you probably need to go out and buy some candy. Be ready for, for the trick-or-treaters that may be coming around. Halloween is often a, a holiday that we associate with, with death. And I even read about a preacher that Sunday fell on Halloween one year. A little girl responded to the invitation. He didn't want to baptize her on Halloween because he didn't want her to associate her baptism with death. Uh, he said, let's wait a few weeks and do it closer to Thanksgiving. Uh, was he right? Why or why not? Let's talk about that. So Romans 6, we'll begin reading in chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may ab abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. For if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Heard about a little boy who uh, was in Sunday school class, and he told his Sunday school teacher, when I get baptized, I'm going to wear my swim goggles. And she said, well, why are you going to wear your swim goggles when you get baptized? He said, because I want to see my sins get washed away. Children have a very simple and straightforward understanding of things sometimes. And when we get older, we tend to make things a little bit more confusing, a little more complicated than they need to be. I mentioned that preacher that didn't want to baptize a girl on Halloween because he didn't want her to associate her baptism with death. Uh, a lot of times we associate Halloween with, with death. And I understand why he would think that. I mean, if you drive through Rutherford, uh, you go out there, tombstones in people's front yards right now. You may see somebody hanging from a tree. You may see all these skeletons and, and different decorations uh, set up around town. And it's all celebrating or thinking about death. Now, I don't think any of these people are actually uh, worshiping uh, demons or thinking about anything like that. It's probably all just good-natured, light-hearted fun, but Halloween is all about death. And so that preacher didn't want this little girl to be baptized and she's impressionable and he didn't want her to associate her baptism with death. Now I understand why that would bother somebody, but I'm convinced that he didn't really understand baptism because baptism is all about death. That, that's what baptism represents. Let's look back at Romans chapter 6, look at verse 3 and 4. Paul wrote, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we're buried by him or with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we were buried with Christ in death, and then like as he was raised up, we were raised up out of that watery grave to a new life. So in order to become a Christian, you have to die. You have to die to your past, and you have to die to your old way of life so that you can live a different life. That's why Romans 6 verse 2 said, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And down in verse 6, it says, Our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. 
Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 basically repeats this same theme, uh, starting in verse 2. Paul said, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And again, Paul's writing in verse 11 when he wrote to Timothy, It's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Tomorrow's Halloween. You've probably seen some horror movies that are on television. I don't watch horror movies. Uh, don't go to haunted houses. If I'm going to spend money to experience an emotion, fear is not the one that I want to pay for. So I don't do any of those things. But tomorrow's Halloween, and it might be kind of eerie to some people to consider that there are dead people walking on earth today. Now, in those horror movies, those dead people might be zombies or something like that. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, if you watch prison movies, you'll hear them talk about people on death row, dead man walking. That's not what I'm talking about either. Uh, I'm talking about people that have died to sin and then been raised to walk with Christ. I'm talking about Christians. Most of the people here this morning are dead people walking. Uh, we've died and we've been raised to walk a new life. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 2. See, we were living in the world, we died to the world, and we were made to walk through Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, says this, And you hath he quickened. Now, quickened is the 1611 way of saying made alive. So Paul's saying, You he's made alive who were dead in trespasses, and sin. We were dead. But Jesus raised us to a new life. Uh, go down to verse 4. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Uh, we were dead in sin. But God made us alive again. It's the grace of God that allowed us to be walking a new life, something different. We used to be dead in sin, but now we're alive in Christ. Uh, in the New Testament, we're told over and over again that in order to belong to Jesus, we have to die. We have to die to our past, to our sinful way of living. Well, what do you do with dead people? Well, you bury them. Baptism is supposed to remind us that our past is gone, that the old man of sin is dead and buried, it doesn't exist anymore. Our sinful self was buried. Uh, now, there's some churches that, that teach that, that burial uh, can be done by pouring a little water on somebody's head or sprinkling some water on them. But if you think about it, that doesn't really make sense. I mean, let's say I died this afternoon. Okay, the people at Carnes would come get me and they'd, they'd get me ready for burial. And then they have this funeral service and y'all all get together and cry and cry. And at least I hope somebody would be upset. But anyway, you, you do that. Then they take me to the cemetery for the burial. What would they do? Would they open the casket and then just sprinkle a little dirt in my face? How about would they get a bucket full of dirt and pour it on top of the casket and say, okay, he's buried now. Now they're gonna have a six foot hole dug out in the cemetery and they're gonna put me down inside there and then they're going to put a whole bunch of dirt on top of me and my body will stay at the bottom of that hole till Jesus comes back to get us. Uh, that's what burial is all about. And that's what the Bible tells us that baptism is supposed to be about. Uh, Romans 6 tells us when we're, when we're baptized into Christ, that we're buried with him in baptism. Baptism always involves a lot of water, just like burial always involves a lot of dirt. When John was baptizing in the Jordan River, John 3.23 says he was baptizing near Salem because there was much water there. Uh, John was baptizing where there was a whole lot of water. Acts 8, turn to Acts 8. Acts chapter 8 is talking about the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip went to meet the Ethiopian eunuch. He was riding along, reading from the book of Isaiah. And Acts 8 verse 36 
As they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. He went on his way rejoicing. There wouldn't be any need of them going down into the water if Philip was just going to pour a little water on his head. I mean, he could have just got a cup of water. They wouldn't even have to get out of the chariot to do that. He could have poured some water on his head. Uh, baptism represents a burial, a physical death and burial. But that's not the end of the story. If you were to respond to the Lord's invitation this morning and come forward to be baptized, we'd go to some place where they got a whole lot of water. And I'd put you under that water. But would I leave you there? No, because then you'd really be dead. You'd be physically dead. You'd need a real grave. When you're baptized, they don't leave you under the water. They bring you up again to represent resurrection. Uh, basically, they raise you from the dead. You die, you're buried, you're raised up again. That's part of God's plan for baptism. It's supposed to represent that death to the old man burial, and then resurrection to walk a new life. That's what verse 4 of our text, Romans 6, 4 said, Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So that preacher was mistaken about not wanting to baptize that girl on Halloween because he didn't want her to associate baptism with death because baptism is all about death and burial and resurrection. But there's something else that that preacher misunderstood. He believed that that girl didn't have to be anxious to be baptized because he felt she was already saved. <coughs> she said she believed in Jesus. She said that she repented of her sins, that she wanted Jesus to be Lord of her life. So he believed that she had already died to her past. And he was just putting off the burial uh, for a little while. But when people die, do we put off the burial? I mean, remember back in Jesus' time, when somebody died, uh, they started stinking in about three days. Uh, over and over, Scripture tells us when people responded to Jesus, they were baptized immediately. Acts 16 talks about Lydia, who was a businesswoman. She and some other ladies were worshiping down by the river. Paul came to them, taught them the gospel. They were baptized right away. Day of Pentecost, when Peter was preaching the first gospel sermon, he told them that they'd kill the Son of God. They said, what should we do? He told them to repent and be baptized, every one of them. He didn't say, now come back here in about a month, and we'll have a baptism, and we'll, we'll baptize you then. No, they baptized them right then. Earlier in Acts 8, we read about the Ethiopian eunuch, and he was coming along. He said, here's water. What keeps me from being baptized? He was baptized as soon as as Philip taught him about Jesus. Then in Acts chapter 16, turn there, let's read a little bit. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in jail. They've been put in prison for preaching the gospel. Uh, they're praying, they're singing, there's an earthquake. Uh, the doors of the prison are open. The jailer comes out, he's ready to kill himself because he knows that under Roman law, if he lets the prisoners escape, that's a capital offense. He's about to kill himself. Uh, he comes down and Paul cries out with a loud voice in verse 28 and says, Do thyself no harm, for we're all here. And then the Philippian jailer asks him, uh, What do I need to do to be saved? Uh, look at verse 32. They spake unto him the word of the Lord to all that were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. Again and again in Acts, we find that when people believed right away, they were baptized. Why? Because you don't leave dead bodies laying around. If someone's ready to die, well, then right after that, you bury them. Well, then why do some churches wait? Well, because they don't believe that baptism is involved in salvation. They think that you're already saved and that baptism is merely a a public declaration of a decision that you've already made. 
In fact, they publish uh, statements that say baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. There's a problem with that. Where do we find that in Scripture? It's not there. Uh, and actually, that's a relatively new teaching as far as Christianity is concerned. For the first uh, 1,500 years, basically, of Christianity, everybody believed that baptism was necessary for salvation. Uh, if you go back to the first century church, the, the Christian fathers, Justin Martyr, who lived from 110 to 165, said this, We've learned from the apostles this reason for baptism in order that we may obtain in the water the remission of sins. Tertullian was another historian. Uh, he wrote, he lived between 145 and 220, and he wrote this, Happy is our sacrament of water in that by washing away the sins of our earthly blindness, we're set free and admitted into eternal life. And there are lots and lots of others. In fact, every church and every preacher for the first 1,500 years of the church taught that baptism was necessary for the forgiveness of sin. Until the year about 1,500, a little after that, there was a man named Zwingli, and he came along and said, no, baptism is a work, and we're saved by faith and faith only, so you shouldn't have to do anything. And since that time, uh, people have drifted away. They said, you don't have to be baptized all you have to do is to say the sinner's prayer or ask Jesus into your heart. But isn't that doing something? I mean, we have to believe. Isn't belief doing something? We have to confess. Isn't that doing something? We have to repent. Isn't repenting doing something? In fact, baptism is the least something I have to do. I just have to submit. Somebody else baptizes me. I don't do anything there. So where do we find the sinner's prayer or, or asking Jesus into your heart in Scripture? We don't because they're not there. Instead, the Bible teaches us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You want to be in Jesus? You need to be baptized. 1 Peter 3, Peter's talking about Noah and how he and his family were saved in the flood uh, 1 Peter 3.21 says, The like figure, whereunto even baptism, doth now also save us. Now wait a minute, I thought the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourself, because we can't do anything. That's right. We are saved by grace through faith. But that faith is shown by us repenting of our sins. That faith is shown by us confessing Jesus as the Lord of our lives. That faith is shown by submitting to baptism. Our baptism is a demonstration that we believe. That's why Colossians 2.12 says this. It says that we are buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. See, faith and baptism work hand in hand. And Jesus himself said in Mark 16.16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now there's nothing miraculous about baptism. There's nothing special in that water that makes our sins go away. Uh, to be baptized without having faith or confessing or repenting, all we're going to get is wet. It's just one of the things that we need to do. Uh, so there are some people that ask, do you really believe if someone believes and repents and confesses Jesus as the Lord of their life, but they're not baptized, that they're going to go to hell. Well, what I believe really doesn't matter. The best explanation I saw of this is, was talking about a real estate agent. So if you bear with me just a little while, let's pretend that Mr. Smith wanted to sell his house. And he came to me and says, uh, I want you to sell my house. He said, I want $100,000 for my house. And so me being a real estate agent, I'd say, okay. And I'd write up a contract and we'd put things in the contract and he'd say, okay, I'll sell my house, everything in it, $100,000, but there's this little portable building out in the backyard. My daddy built that building. It's really special to me and I don't want that to go with the house. I'm going to take that with me when I move. Everything else, lock, stock, and barrel goes with the house except that building. So I 
write up the contract. I put the advertisements out. Somebody comes up to Roberts Realty and they say, uh, hi, I'm Mr. Jones. I want to buy Mr. Smith's house. I love that house. It's just what I want. And I'll pay the asking price. Here's $100,000. said, in fact, my favorite part about that house is that little building out in the backyard. I've always admired that little building and, and I want that little building. We got a problem. We've had an offer. We've had an acceptance. But if, is that house sold yet? Well, no, because in real estate, they have what's called a, a meeting of the minds. Everybody has to agree on every detail. I've heard that there's even some, some things as minute as the color of a light switch plate that have kept a real estate deal from going through. Uh, so I got to tell Mr. Jones, uh, I can't say, Mr. Jones, that's no problem. Give me that $100,000. I'm sure Mr. Smith would be happy to sell you that building because that's not what Mr. Smith has said. Uh, it's not my house. It's not my decision. I can't do it the way I want to do it. I also can't say, oh, I'm sorry. Take your money away. I'm sure he won't have anything to do with you. Uh, he doesn't want your money. No, because it's Mr. Smith's house. He might want to sell it. He might agree to sell that building, even though he said he wouldn't. Uh, so what they have is what they call a counter offer. I might suggest, okay, here's what you need to do. Offer him $110,000 if he'll throw in that building. And so he writes a counter offer. He gives that. Does that mean Mr. Smith has to sell him the house? No, he doesn't have to accept that counter offer. Now, what if I'm the real estate agent and I know Mr. Smith doesn't want to sell that building. I know Mr. Jones wants to buy that building, but I just don't mention that building. I say, okay, you give me that money. I take the money, I give it to Mr. Smith, I keep my commission, I give Mr. Jones the check, I mean the key, and I leave. What's gonna happen when they both think they own that building? Well, they're gonna come back looking at me. I'm gonna get sued. I might even get arrested because it wasn't my house. I didn't have the authority to change the contract. God has a home in heaven that he's made available to us. He's given us the New Testament that shows his conditions. He's saying, here's what you need to do to have this home. The conditions say you've got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to confess him as Lord of your life. You've got to be baptized, to have your sins washed away. And then you've got to live out a faithful life. Let's say that we come down here, we sing the invitation song. Somebody comes forward and says, I want to be a Christian. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I'm sorry for the way I've sinned. I'm willing to be baptized, but I don't really want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I like making my own decisions. I want to keep on doing the things that I've been doing. Now I'll do all those other things, but I don't want to confess Jesus. I don't want to make, I don't want to put him in charge. What that person has done is they've made God a counteroffer. They say, I like all these things, but I don't like that. Will God accept that counteroffer? Home in heaven is not mine to give. That's not my decision to make, but I can't tell somebody that's going to be okay with God. Don't worry about it. I've got to go by the conditions of the contract. That's why James 3.1 says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. If I know what God's word said, and I tell you anything different, then I'm going to be judged for that. I'm going to be held to account. God expects us to tell what the Bible says. The Bible says you need to be a Christian. It's the only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. The Bible says in order to be added to the Lord's church, you have to believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live out a godly life. Uh, won't you accept Jesus' conditions right now as we stand together, as we sing?